What's up YouTube? It is your boy JB and I am here today with a review for The Haves and the Have Nots. This is Season 8, Episode 2, titled Power of the Purse. You guys, this was an interesting episode, I will say the least. I didn't hate it. I didn't hate it. I didn't like it. And it wasn't the episode itself that bothered me. It was a particular character that bothered me. Jim Cryer. Oh, God. When I found out that he supports you-know-who, it's just hard looking at him because I'm looking at him now and I'm like, how much of this is an act and how much of this is real? Oh, God, how do you support that ignorance? Jeez Louise. Also, you guys, I have been binge-watching Sisters. So I'm not going to start reviewing it just yet, but like I said, when it comes to the mid-season, if they do have a mid-season finale, once it comes back from the mid-season finale, then I'll pick up Sisters. Um, but without further ado, you guys, let's go ahead and jump into this episode review, shall we? All right, you guys, so this episode, it picked up where the last one left off. You guys remember that um, Hannah was at the, at the Criers and um, Derek showed up. So Derek shows up and he wants to talk to Hannah. He wants to apologize to Hannah for raping her. Um, yeah, you just kind of, I mean, does he think that that's going to solve everything, that she's just going to magically forgive him? You violated her, you raped her, and you got her pregnant. So, yeah, your apology doesn't mean anything. <laughs> like, he wants to apologize. Talking about he's found God. I mean, good for you. That it, You know, I was on Hannah's side the whole time. I'm like, yeah, nah, bro. Just because you found God don't mean that I'm supposed to forgive you for raping me. You took advantage of me and violated me. So, yes. He's like, well, don't you believe in the Lord? Yes. Well, you know, it's, it's the um, way of God to forgive. It is. You, you should forgive and forget. Well, not necessarily forget, but you should forgive. So, you know, Hannah told him, like, you know, I forgave, you know, I've forgiven you a long time ago, but it wasn't for you. It was for me. And, you know, he, she called the police on him. She pulled a knife on him and she called the police on him. And the fact that he just sat, I was like, dude, she just called the police on you. Now, as you was getting ready to walk out, she said, you know, it's all good. But then when, you know, um, he came back, she was, you know, she told him, can they come? And then I was listening to the police. I'm like, wait a minute. Are they giving her the runaround? <laughs> I've never heard that from the police that they give. I mean, they were just giving her the runaround. Is he this? Is he that? Da, 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 da. If the woman is telling you that there is someone in the house that, you know, she needs police help and, you know, it's an intruder or whatever. Yeah, these cops are really incompetent. They make, you know, I know this is supposed to be Savannah, Georgia. God, incompetent as the fuck. So, you know, Hannah also tells Derek that since she has, you know, um, Catherine's power of attorney, because he's talking about I still work, and she says, well, you know what, since I have power of attorney, your ass is fired. And if you come back around here again, she's like, do you believe in, you believe in the Lord, right? You want to meet God, right? It's like, well, if you come around here, I'll come around me anytime again. I will make sure that it happens sooner than you think. I'm like, ooh, okay, Hannah. So then as Derek is getting ready to leave, he goes outside. I'm like, dude, by the time you walk outside that door, the cops will be there. And lo and behold, oh, God. Wait, what did that say? So I just got an alert on Twitter, and it said, you know, who was going to use um, a, the power? He was going to veto something. I have to go look at it later. I should have put this on airplane mode. I would have never saw that. But yeah, um, that's what I was saying, Derry. The whole time he was sitting, I'm like, dude, by the time you walk outside, those cops are going to be there. And lo and behold, when he got outside, the cops were there. Now, Hannah did tell him that, tell the cops that, you know, everything is good. He's just leaving. He used to work here. So one of the cops asks Derek for his driver's license, and he gives it to him. Actually, not at first. But then once he gives it to him, he says, you know what, I'm going to go run it. You stay here with my partner. So he goes to the car, runs the driver's license, and boom, Derek has a warrant 
forgot what the one was for. I think it was for domestic abuse or something like that. Whatever, don't really give a shit. So they arrested him. So then, oh, we see Jim. Jim is still in this damn hospital. I just don't understand why this fool is in this hospital. And did I hear the doctor correctly? He, they put a, a metal rod in his arm. For what? For what? Wasn't that a duck bullet? The consistency with the writing. That's, that is irritating. Jim, it's a flesh wound. I, okay, never mind. Let's just move on. But Jim is asking to be released from the hospital. The doctor is advising against it. I'm like, why are you advising against it? He's not even on the IV drip. So why is he still here? Why are you advising against it? Free up that hospital bed for somebody who needs it. Like, I, I just did not get it. So then, you know, as a doctor leave, Marty comes in. And Marty tells Jim that, you know, Wyatt has been, has been brought to the hospital because he tried to kill himself. Wait a minute. But did Jim know that he was in there before? For the same shit? Because this is Wyatt's second trip to the hospital for suicide. I mean, technically, this one wasn't on him. This was Vinny, but that's neither here nor there. But I'm going to pause here and we're going to keep moving, you guys. All right, you guys, and next we see Celine. So Celine is working, and then Jimmy shows up. You know, I was thinking about something. Um, with Jimmy, I mean, they really aged Jimmy. Because the first time we ever met Jimmy, Jimmy was, looked like he was about three or four years old. But now Jimmy looks like he's about, you know, the funny thing is with these characters, they're supposed to be in their 20s. But you can tell that, I mean, you definitely know they're not in their 20s. They look older than I am. Like even Gavin Houston, who plays um, um, Jeffrey. I know Gavin Houston is supposed to be playing 20, but he actually is. See, when I first thought, saw Gavin, I was thinking Gavin was somewhere in my age range, but he's 40. I'm like, wow, he looks good for his age. Um, but yeah, Jimmy shows up to talk to Celine about this eviction. And Celine says that she got it covered. You know, she got an attorney talking about Veronica, and, you know, Jimmy is like, well, how about we go in that son of a bitch's room and talk to him? And she's like, who are you talking about? He says, Jim. He's like, I've already saw him. I'm like, yeah, you sure did already see your daddy. And your daddy was a king asshole. So as they're talking, who comes out but king asshole himself, Jim Cryer, being his usual self. I'm just like, oh. Telling Jim, you know, what I should have called the, um, you know, security on you when you pulled that gun on me. Yeah, Jim, you were going to call security on a man that has a gun pulled on you. By the time security would have got there, he would have shot you and dipped out. So, um, Jim tells them that he's going to go see um, why. He says, oh, the drug addict. He was, like, he was like, yeah, my real son. I'm like, oh, God, will somebody just punch him, punch him, stab him shoot him, do something to him, put me out of my misery of seeing the likes of Jim Cryer. So, um, and then, you know, he, he, he's messing with Celine, talking about the fact that Jimmy is short and he's tall. She might want to go look at somebody else. I'm like, Jim, shut the hell up. So then, you know, Celine's boss comes and gets her and, you know, takes her to his office. And he's telling her that, I guess, I think he said a doctor said that he saw Celine harassing Jim. I'm like, did she really harass Jim? Because I was actually trying to remember that. Like, did she harass him? Because I couldn't remember. I really couldn't. I mean, so many people have been in and out of Jim's room. More specifically, David. Which we're going to talk about David in just a little bit because David in this episode worked every nerve in my body. Ugh. So then we do see Jim. So he goes and talks to Wyatt. Wyatt is, you know, apologizing profusely and, you know, telling Jim, send me to rehab. I don't want to go to jail. I don't want to do this. And then Jim, again, being his what? His typical asshole self. Honestly, I wish Wyatt had took his worthless ass out. That's all I was thinking about the whole time, you know, 
because what did he call him? He, what did he call him? A worthless piece? He called him a little piece, a little shit. Something like I'm just like, oh, dear God. Can somebody just? I mean, there's so much stuff in the hospital. Like, you got to get away with murder in a hospital. No one would be none the wiser, probably. You could rule it. You could rule his death accidental. I mean, there's a lot of shit you could say. But that's neither here nor there. I'm gonna move on. All right, you guys. And then next, let's David. David shows up at the hospital like the good old boy that he is talking to Jim. So you know, um, Jim is telling him about Wyatt, and Jim asks David, "Can Jeffrey go see Wyatt?" I'm sure he can, Jim. I'll give him a call from the car. And it's just like, what? You know, David and Jim at this point are jokes, and we're, and for sure, David, for David to be a have you know be a former judge. Now you are the bitch of Jim Cryer. You're the good old boy. You the Uncle Tom. You you sucking and jiving for massa. Like it just makes it, it doesn't make any sense to me. So Jim says that you know he wants to make Wyatt pay for shooting him, and that you know he still has his plan in place for Veronica. I'm just a trip enough of that that this episode was Jim centric. Why? Why? Jim is so hated, but whatever. <clears throat> so then we see Jeffrey and Madison. So Jeffrey is watching Madison as he's sleeping. Madison wakes up. Jeffrey asks him, is he worried? You know, was he thinking about Veronica? He says no at first, but then he says yes. <clears throat> and Jeffrey's like, well, you know, I'm so sorry that you know about this. He says, don't be. You're worth it. So then Jeffrey is talking about the fact that he feels like Veronica is plotting against their, you know, their demise. Veronica's probably been plotting against everybody's demise. She's plotting against yours. She's plotting against, um, you know, Crash Test Dummy, aka Laura. She's plotting against Samuel. She's plotting against David. She's plotting against Jim. She's plotting against Catherine, Hannah, probably Candace. Shit, anybody that comes in her crosshairs, she's plotting your de demise. So then David calls him and he says, is this a bad time? <laughs> and Madison starts laughing and I did too. <laughs> and Jeffrey's like, can you hear that? He's like, yeah. So Jeffrey, so Jeffrey's talking to Jim, I mean not Jim, but David. David asked him, will he go see, Je uh, to go see Wyatt? Because Wyatt tried to kill himself. Who cares? Literally, who cares about why he's trying to kill himself? Because I don't. So then we do see Jeffrey. So Jeffrey goes and sees why a drug addict ass. And he asks him, how did you get in here? He says, Madison got me in here. So he says, is the car still out there? He says, no. He says, well, I'm gonna try to, I want to try to make a run for it. And Jeffrey's like, how are you going to make a run for it when you're handcuffed to the bed? Not really going anywhere. So then Wyatt is like, well, you know, I'm trying to get my dad to send me to rehab. And Jeffrey's like, you know they're going to press charges against you, right? He says, no, they're not. He says, yes, they are. Your dad's going to press charges against you. He says, he's weak. And then we find out that, you know, um, Wyatt is just trying to play this victim role so that his dad sends him to rehab. And then he goes off on Jeffrey. So, Jeffrey, you're not my friend. I don't want to hear from you. I don't want to see you. And Jeffrey's like, okay, that's fine. And, you know, he was like, well, you know, don't try to call me. And Jeff says, I, I won't. And don't you try to call me because my number's changed. And Wyatt was like, well, yeah, my number's changed too. He says, yeah, I know, to a prison number. So Jeffrey ends up leaving. I don't know why Jeffrey puts up with, with Wyatt's bullshit. I don't get it. I would have said fuck Wyatt a long time ago. I know Jeffrey was in love with him, and I still don't understand why he was in love with that. I mean, when he found out she was gay... When he found out you were gay, he treated you like shit, and you still look. couldn't be me. Let's move on. All right, guys, and then we're closing the episode out. So we see Jim. So Jim went to go see Catherine at jail. So when Catherine comes in, she asks, how was Wyatt? He's like, um, hello, I'm right here. She says, how was Wyatt? He says, you know, you don't see me here with my arm in a sling. How's Wyatt? 
he's okay, but you're not going to ask about me. She says, okay, Jim, how are you? He says, do you really care? She's like, not really. Hell, I don't care either. Jim, your arm is in a sling. You're going to be fine, dude. Like, there's nothing wrong with you. It's a flesh wound. I wish, you know, uh, Catherine had punched him. Like she said, she will, she ought to, she should have punched him right in the fucking arm. She should have. And then, you know, he was talking about telling her, you know, say, gee golly, Jim, you're right. That's almost as, nope, that's not as bad. It's not as bad, but it's just, it's like teetering with him telling Hannah to call him Mr. Jim. Like, I can't get over that, and I can't believe the fact that Tyler Perry wrote that in the, in the script for a white man to tell a black woman to call him Mr. Jim. But whatever. So Jim tells Hannah that, not Hannah, but Catherine, that they, you know, he has a workaround for her being in jail, but it might cost them some money. He does tell her that the case that George has against her is solid. And when he mentioned George, I'm like, oh shit, I literally forgot about George. We ha when is the last time we saw George? We have not saw George since the beginning Nope. We haven't saw George since the first few, ep I think like the first two episodes of the second half of season seven. And we ain't saw George since. But I guess we would because we're still on the same day, right? That is confusing as hell. The timeline. The timeline is confusing. I don't know if 24 hours has passed or 48 hours has passed because when you look at it, it doesn't look, it doesn't feel like time has passed. Actually, I don't think time has passed. Because Wyatt shot Catherine and Jim. He went to jail. He tried to commit suicide. He escaped the hospital. I don't think Thomas, I don't think, I think this is still the same night. But see, that's confusing because when I think about Veronica and Samuel with them, the time has changed because at one point, it was daylight. It was daylight when Samuel first started cleaning the pool, and then it was nighttime when, um, uh, what's his name, Colby and them got in the pool. It was definitely daylight. I know it was. I'm almost positive it was daylight. This show is inconsistent when I actually just sit and think about it. The more I sit and think about it, this show is actually really inconsistent when it comes to the timeline. Because f for sure, yes. Because think, I'm remembering when in a few, uh, I think it was, it wasn't the first episode of this season. It was the last episode of whenever Samuel and Laura was talking outside of um, Veronica's house, that was daylight. It was daylight. So what is the, t okay, I, I just thought about it. Like this timeline is off completely. Because with Catherine, no time has changed. You can't tell me that any time has changed because it's been, with, when it comes to them, it's been dark. It's been dark since last seat, since they got shot. I'm, I'm right. I'm so one. I'm 100% right with this one. The timeline with Catherine, Wyatt, all of them has not changed, but the timeline with Veronica and all of them has definitely changed. How is that possible? Okay, let's move on. Because <laughs> it's interesting to think about it. All right, so then we see um, the last part of the episode. I'm going to be honest with you guys, I wasn't listening. Cause it was David and Jim, but David took Jim home like the good old boy he is. You know, Jim is talking about his plan to, you know, kill Veronica 
D David suggests that he kills Catherine. Jim tells him he can't do that because Catherine got him by the balls and the purse strings. Then David mentions the $8 million, but Candace and, and Benny has the $8 million. Why don't he kill Candace? He can't kill Candace because the Malones are protecting him. But, you know, um, David's going to see how much Mama Rose and um, Benny knows. Then he also tells him to get the power of attorney. But wait a minute. How do they not know that Hannah has the power of attorney? I thought Jim knew that. I thought they knew that. They do know that. Because Hannah, wait, no, that was that was about the car. They, I'm, they do, I think they know about Hannah having power of attorney. I, I'm pretty positive they know. Again, here we go, but then something that's inconsistent to me. But you guys, that's the review. Um, be sure to like this video, leave your comments in the comment section below. Subscribe to the channel, hit that bell notification button so you guys are aware of when I drop anything else. Share this video and until the next one, you guys do me a solid favor out there. Stay safe, take care of yourselves, wash your hands, wear your mask, and socially distance you guys. And I'll see you guys later. Bye.